All right, if you remember from last week, we uh, talked about this idea of witnessing for Jesus as being an important part of who we are. This idea of telling people what Jesus has done in our life. So what I want to do this morning is wrap up this two-week message. And here's the question that I want to unpack this morning. So if it's important to be a witness, what does it take to reach the culture that we live in today? If we're going to be a witness for Jesus, how can we do that in ways that are most effective? Obviously, to do it in ways that it was done back then is not going to be as effective as it needs to be today. I shared with you last week that we have this call to reach outside the church building, that we're literally called to go into the world and reach the lost, not sit and wait for them to come to us. Jesus gives us this instruction in John 4.35, where he says, Do you not say, four months more in the harvest, and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. So we need to be going out. So how can we be effective in doing that? Well, I want to talk about that by looking at two different styles of sharing the gospel message. And I give you these two different styles because the truth is that we are all wired differently. And that's good because there's no one way to tell people about Christ. It takes all kinds of Christians to reach all kinds of non-Christians. I like to say that all people cannot witness the same way, but all people can witness some way. And so once you figure out your witnessing style, you'll have greater freedom to make an eternal impact in the lives of those around you. And keep this very important thought in mind as we go through these two styles. Evangelism is taking the initiative in the power of the Holy Spirit to help a person move one step closer in the process of coming to saving faith in Christ. Evangelism is just taking the initiative using the power of the Holy Spirit. It's moving a person one step closer in this process of coming to faith. So if you remember that, then it takes the pressure off. You see, it's not your job to get someone saved. It's simply your job to tell them about Jesus Christ. God wants to use you to help someone take that next step toward his son Jesus. If you're willing to do that, whether you see results or not, then you're a successful witness for Jesus. Now before we unlock our styles for this morning, let me give you some guidelines. Because if I explain these to you and you understand them but you don't use them, then my time has been wasted. So here's the first guideline. The goal for this morning is to discover your style and begin using it. That's the important part, using it. So listen carefully and ask God to reveal what style most accurately describes you. You see, once you're aware of how you're wired, then you look for ways to use that wiring in witnessing to others. Now the second thing is you may be a combination of styles. It's likely that you'll find yourself using a combination of these two different things, depending on the situation and the person. And then also remember that no style is superior to another. So resist the urge to judge others who might witness differently than you do. Be gracious to those who use a different style. And then the fourth thing is you will need to rely on the help of others. You need to rely on the prayer of of others. Share with others that there are people you're witnessing to. Ask people to be praying for you that you would have the courage and the words to say. And ask them to pray for the person that their heart would be softened to hear the word. So keep those four things in mind as I talk about these two different styles. Let me give you the first one. The first one is the confrontational style. Now when we look at God's word, there's a man who stands out as a very confrontational individual, a man by the name of Peter. So let's look at how God harnessed Peter's personality and giftedness to confront people with the reality of their sins, the death of Jesus, and the truth of the resurrection. So how did Peter go about it? If there's one thing we know about Peter, it's the fact that whatever he did, he did it full force. When Jesus asked the disciples in Matthew 16, 15, who they thought he was, it was Peter who boldly declared that Jesus was the Messiah. When Peter was in the fishing boat and he wanted to be with Jesus, he didn't hesitate to do what it would take to be close to his master. He stepped out of the boat 
He wanted to meet Jesus. He was bold. When, this, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, Peter became the slasher and cut off someone's ear. Peter was brash. He was bold. And he didn't beat around the bush. So it's not surprising then that Jesus chooses him as a spokesperson on the day of Pentecost. This day when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, it was a perfect fit. Peter's personality was custom designed for this situation. Let me set the scene for you. It's in the second chapter of the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit has come on the disciples and they begin speaking in different languages. Languages that were represented, by the way, by the non-believers who were there. So in essence, they're speaking different languages so that all of these people are hearing the gospel message in their own language. Well, the people are fascinated by this. They wonder what's going on. These men shouldn't be speaking all these different languages. They didn't know all these different languages. Some even begin to suggest that these men are drunk on wine. They're just acting stupid. That's when, Jean, that's when Peter jumps up and he explains what's going on. You see, for Peter, this is natural. He's just being Peter, the confrontational Peter. And after listening to Peter explain, the people are afraid. And they ask him what they have to do to be right with God. That's where we pick up the story of verse 38. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So Peter, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, stands up, he raises his voice, and he confronts his listeners with the facts. And God blesses his efforts. In the rest of the passage, we're told that 3,000 people were saved and baptized that same day. Can you imagine that? 3,000 people, that's amazing. And they were saved because Peter confronted the situation. He was bold. And in his bold, confrontational style, we see two key elements that Peter uses. The first is that his message was very easy to understand. His message was very clear to the people. Look at his words in verses 32 through 36. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now that's very clear, right? He not only personalized his witness, Peter got right to the heart of the issue. Those who feel most comfortable with this confrontational approach have this special ability for clarity. They have a way to take theological truths and put them in an easy-to-understand format. In verse 14, we read that Peter stood up and said, Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. This literally means to take in one's ear so that you can know it fully. So Peter wanted to present the gospel in a way that they could grasp and respond to. So he didn't pull any punches. He wanted his listeners to get the story straight. And in verse 36, he summarizes his message. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The message paraphrase puts it this way. It says, all Israel then know this. There's no longer room for doubt. God made him master and Messiah, this Jesus whom you killed on a cross. Can Peter be any clearer than that? His message was easy to understand. That's the first element. The second element of his style is that his message was geared toward a life-changing decision. You see, Peter wasn't interested in just giving the people information. He's going after life transformation. He understood the consequences of ignoring Christ. I love verse 37. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. 
and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Now, to be cut to the heart means they were violently ag agitated, as if they were pierced with a needle. That's the definition. It's this sharp pain that is associated with remorse. So they're shook up. They're filled with horror at what they had done. They had crucified their long-awaited Messiah. They had rejected their only hope of salvation. God had passed judgment, and they knew he was right. They knew they were guilty. The confrontational witness wants the listener to understand their sin and make a decision on what they're going to do about it. So Peter is plain and to the point. He's persuasive, and he's practical. And God used him to break through the hearts of over 3,000 people that day. Now Peter, with this confrontational style, exhibited some common traits. In general, people who like this style are confident. They're bold and direct. They skip small talk and get right to the point. They have strong opinions and convictions. That's Peter. Now if his approach describes you, let me just give you a few cautions. The first one is that you need to seek God's wisdom so you'll be appropriately sens sensitive and tactful. And then allow the Holy Spirit to restrain your desire to come on strong in every situation. You have to know your audience. Avoid judging or laying guilt trips on others who have a different evangelistic style. So the bottom line is this, in your direct, bold way, just be sure that the Holy Spirit is going ahead of you. There's a difference between boldness and meanness. We never want to be mean in our witnessing, but we do want to be bold. So that's the confrontational style. Let me talk about the second style, which is the intellectual style. Now, who better illustrates this than the Apostle Paul? Let me read a passage from Acts 17. It illustrates this logical and well-reasoned gospel presentation that Paul is known for. I'm going to start at verse 16. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's of design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, 
But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Now, can you think of a better person for God to send to the Athenian philosophers in Acts 17? These intellectual heavyweights would not have related to Peter's turn or burn approach. They would not have appreciated the confrontational approach. They needed logic that conclusively proved its point. So because of that, Paul reasoned with them. Now Paul's audience was probably more like our society than Peter's was. We live in a world that doesn't really know what to believe, and at times, frankly, could care less. It's like the woman who walked into a jewelry store looking for a necklace, and as she looked over the display case, she said, I'd like a gold cross. And the salesman behind the counter looked over the selection and asked, do you, you want a plain one or the one with the little man on it? Now, it's sad to hear that story, but it's not so far-fetched in our society, right? You would be amazed how little people know about Jesus Christ. The men of Athens were happy to see Paul because they loved to argue about new ideas. To them, a good day included some type of philosophical discussion. There are so many things to see in this chapter and so little time. But the first important thing I want to see is in verse 16, which says this. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed that the city was full of idols. So Paul comes into the city, and he is greatly distressed. That literally means that he was sick to his stomach. Paul knew there was work that needed to be done. There were arguments that needed to be made. He wasn't content to just think about convincing these people. He knew that it was his job to do that. So he saw there was a need, but then he filled it. When you look at our world today, are you greatly distressed by what you see? I hope you are, because if you aren't, you'll never catch this desire like Paul had to change things. So if we go through life thinking, no, oh, things really aren't that bad, then the fire of witnessing will never burn in our hearts. Paul was consumed by the decay of the cities he visited. They, he knew that they desperately needed to hear the gospel message. But more importantly, not only did he see the need, he met the need. In verse 17 of that chapter, we see that he went to work. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. He also went into the marketplace day by day and witnessed to those who happened to be there. So he spent time in the religious centers, and just not in the religious centers, but in the marketplace. And the text says he did it every day. Remember, we need to go to the people. And so we see that through his perseverance, some philosophers eventually wanted to debate with him. They've heard They've heard Paul. Now they want to debate with him. People have come from the marketplace and said, have you heard this man? And so they bring him before the Supreme Court of Athens. And they ask him to explain his beliefs. What a great lesson Paul gives us here, never giving up. This is really one of the most dramatic scenes in the entire New Testament. Paul is invited onto their turf at their, invita at their invitation. He has this wonderful opportunity to preach the gospel message to them. So what principles does Paul use to argue intellectually with these people? What principles can we learn from him? If this is our style. Let me give you three things we learn from this interaction that Paul has with the non-believers. The first thing we learn is that we should be courteous. If we want to follow Paul's lead, the first thing that we need to do is be considerate and civil. Look again at verse 22. It says, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. What a great approach. You see, Paul starts right where his listeners are. He didn't denounce them or attack their idolatry. In fact, he pays them a compliment. He basically says, as I've been walking around your city, I've noticed one thing about you, and that's that you guys are really into religion. Now, 
In our world today, there are a lot of religious people. They believe there's a God. Many of them just need to understand who God really is. You see, it's not that they don't want to believe. They just don't know what to believe. So be courteous. They want to believe, but they don't know what to believe. The second principle we learn from Paul is that we need to be courageous. Verse 23, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. And he says, I'm going to explain who that God is. Now the phrase something unknown really means in ignorance. In effect, he's saying, you admit there is a God you don't know. But I happen to know that God. And I want to tell you about it. That is a tremendous evangelistic strategy. I mean, how can they be offended when he starts by quoting the inscription from one of their own altars? And then he recounts what their own poets have said. By admitting there is more to God than they know, they have opened the door for Paul to preach the gospel boldly. Now, people in our world today are seeking the unknown. They have a spiritual void in their lives. That's why there's so many cults in our world. You see, the spiritual void in someone's life will be filled. The question is, what will it be filled with? So after Paul has set the stage, he begins telling them about God. He tells them about this God who made the world, everything in it. He doesn't live in temples built by hands. He's not served by humans. He gives us life and breath. So Paul here is given a short theology question. He courageously speaks of God as the creator and the giver of all things. He establishes the fact that God is near enough for us to reach out to him so that we can find what we're looking for. He says, I know you have this for you. God is near. And finally, verse 30 shows us the depth of Paul's courage when he says, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now, he commands all people everywhere to repent. That's what you call being courageous. He gets to the Peter part, right? Now he calls everyone to repent. Now maybe this second approach sounds like you this morning. If it does, I would encourage you, when the Holy Spirit gives you opportunity, speak for Jesus. Tell people about his death so they understand that he died in their place. That they can be forgiven for all the sins they've committed. Tell them about the resurrection so they have hope for eternity. Tell them about the love and peace and joy that will be theirs once they surrender to Christ. Let me give you some encouragement as I wrap up this message. In the times when you feel like you're talking to a wall and witnessing to others, think back to the three reactions to Paul's intellectual reasoning of the gospel. In verse 32, we read that some were contemptuous. It says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. So Paul was ridiculed, made fun of for his faith by some, but others were curious and wanted to hear more. So everyone's not going to be receptive to the message. But in verse 34, we see the payoff. A few men became followers of Paul, right? And a number of others, and a woman, Damaris. So his message reached some. This is what we can expect when we become involved in the lives of lost people. Some will mock us. Others will be curious and ask questions. Some will be convicted and commit themselves to Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. Let me close with this thought. An old deacon was leading in prayer, and he was using one of his stereotypical phrases, which was, O oh Lord, touch the unsaved with thy finger. And as he spoke these words in this particular prayer, he stopped. And he was quiet. And after several moments, some members came to his side and they asked him if he was all right, if he was ill. And he said, no, I'm not ill. He said, I just, he says, as I prayed, this idea of touch the unsaved with thy finger, he said, something seemed to say to me, thou art the finger. We're called to show others Christ. We're called to be witnesses in the lost world. 
praying for God to save others is great, but as you do that, remember that we are his hands and feet. We are that finger. We are the finger that is used to touch the lives of others. That's our function in the process. We are the planters. God is the reaper. But we are all called to be his witnesses. Father, as I prayed last week, I pray again this week. Give us boldness. Send us out into your field, whatever style we may be, whatever comfort level, level we are at. Help us to understand that you are our strength. You are our guide. You will give us the words. But you call us to go and make the saints. Help us to be strong in that, we pray in your name.